This morning's reading is taken from John chapter 6, verses 41 to 59, and it's on page 1071. At this, the Jews began to grumble about him, because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, Is this not Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? Stop grumbling among yourselves, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I will raise him up at the last day. It is written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. Everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. No one has seen the Father except the one who is from God. Only he has seen the Father. I tell you the truth. He who believes has everlasting life. I am the bread of life. Your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, yet they died. But here is the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he will live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I will give for the life of the world. Then the Jews began to argue, argue sharply amongst themselves. How can this man give us his flesh to eat? Jesus said to them, I tell you the truth. Unless you can eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood has eternal life, and I will raise him up at the last day. For my flesh is real food, and my blood is real drink. Whoever eats my flesh and drinks my blood remains in me and I in him. Just as the living Father sent me and I live because of the Father, so the one who feeds on me will live because of me. This is the bread that came down from heaven. Your forefathers ate manna and died, but he who feeds on this bread will live forever. He said this while teaching in the synagogue in Capernaum. This is the word of the Lord. Vicky, thank you very much indeed. Um, please, please keep open page 1070, um, 1071, um, so that we can see what the Lord is saying through these words this morning. And as you have that open in front of you, let me lead us in a prayer. Almighty God, we praise and thank you that this morning as we worship you, we recognize that alongside you seated at your right hand is your son, our Lord Jesus Christ, who spoke these words um, when he was on earth. Uh, and we say, we, we pray that Father and Son together, you would send your spirit among us now to hear these words afresh, to receive them with faith and to respond to them as they are intended, that we may have life in Jesus' name. Amen. A very good morning to each of you. It's great to see friends, familiar faces, uh, and some unfamiliar faces. And we've been camped in John chapter 6 for the last couple of weeks now. If you were here last week, you heard Jesus say these words. I am the bread of life. Whoever comes to me will never go hungry, and whoever believes in me will never be thirsty. John chapter 6 and verse 35. And do you remember, he spoke those words, having just fed the crowd of 5,000 men and women and children, perhaps 15,000 people with a carrier bag's worth of food. So we were considering last week the depth of what Jesus was saying, that, that he himself is spiritual food sent from heaven by God so that you and I can feast on him and receive eternal life. He's the bread of life. Uh, they used to sing it at rugby matches, didn't they? Do you remember? Bread of heaven, bread of heaven, feed me now and evermore. So these words, in one sense, are familiar to us. They're spoken by Christ to bring faith and assurance. And yet, in us or in people we know, these words will be met with skepticism, doubt, surprise, perhaps even offense. Tell me, do you really 
do you really believe Jesus came from heaven? That he was more than a mere man? That he was really the product of a virgin birth? You, you really believe that? Or perhaps we'll find ourselves put off by that claim that only by feasting and feeding on Christ can we have eternal life. Perhaps we want his voice to be one voice among many influencers. Perhaps we have been trying to feed on him, but we're finding ourselves empty. Well, if doubts or skepticism or surprise or offense arise, then we're in the company of the crowd this morning in John chapter 6. They were those who actually saw the miracle take place. Thousands fed with a carrier bag's worth of food, and yet, moments later, they were grumbling, arguing, and many of them not turning to him with faith, but from him. I once heard a university lecturer suggest if he'd only seen Jesus in the flesh performing such miracles, of course he would have had faith in him. But the problem for them then, as it is for us now, is whether we let the sign point us to the man who is God, the bread of heaven. The situation, the solution is not seeing the miracle for ourselves, but hearing his words and believing in them. We're going to hear two objections that the crowd made to Jesus that day and his words of response. And the question is, will we weigh his words and allow ourselves to be challenged by what Jesus is saying? So what's objection number one the crowd make? Well, it's that first one. This man's not from heaven. Not at all. Verse 41, look down with me. The Jews began to grumble because he said, I am the bread that came down from heaven. They said, isn't this Jesus, the son of Joseph, whose father and mother we know? How can he now say, I came down from heaven? You see, they, they were surprised by and doubted that this man could be the God-man, that the, the word of God become flesh. Uh, you might think it's because they'd not been to enough Christmas nativity stories, but in all seriousness, they hadn't had the angel appear to them when he told Mary she would be pregnant. They'd not seen the angels on the hillside. The shepherds saw, in their experience, he looked like a man. And they were not convinced he was anything more than that. It's the kind of response that we meet when someone flat out denies that Jesus is anything more than human. The kind of person trying to sidestep what Jesus is saying because it's uncomfortable. I suppose on the face of it, the crowd's caution is sensible, isn't it? You know, if someone walked through the door this morning and tried to persuade us they were sent from heaven, we might be rightly skeptical. But then that person hasn't just performed a miraculous feeding of thousands of people. I think the issue for this crowd was the challenge of what Jesus was saying, I am the bread of heaven, it unsettled their deeply entrenched mindset. Their deeply seated beliefs, the story of who they were, which they did not want to be confronted. Just look down in verse 49. Jesus says to them, your forefathers ate the manna in the desert, yet they died. He says the same thing in verse 58. And yet he says of himself, I am the bread that comes down from heaven, which a man may eat and not die. I'm pretty sure Joe has stood in the pulpit before and mentioned the Copernican Revolution. Uh, and of course, many of us will be familiar with the story, okay? F a few hundred years ago, of course, everyone believed that the earth was in the middle of the universe and the sun went around us. But of course, Copernicus, after careful observation and calculation, rightly stated the truth. The earth goes around the sun. And here were people Jesus is taking an image for this crowd, an ancient, deeply entrenched belief, and changing it, a bit like Copernicus. You see, that, that history under Moses' leadership after the people came out from Egypt through the Red Sea, for 40 years, God had provided bread every morning among the campsite of God's people. They had no homes or ovens of their own. But... 
he sent manna each morning, a gift from heaven, bread, and every person went to get enough to feed themselves. And the Jews listening to Jesus are rightly fond of this story. They are literally made of it. They've grown up on it. And yet Jesus is saying, a bit like saying, the earth goes round the sun, I am the bread of heaven. I am the one sent from heaven. The manna was supposed to be a great signpost to me. After all, your forefathers died. That bread kept them going only for a lifetime. I am here to provide eternal life from God. Miraculous bread. And so how does Jesus answer this objection as they say, you can't be from heaven. I think he's saying, be taught by God, then you'll come to me. Be taught by God, verse 43. Stop grumbling, Jesus answered. No one can come to me unless the Father who sent me draws him, and I'll raise him up at the last day. It's written in the prophets, they will all be taught by God. I wonder if verse 44 sticks in your throat. As if Jesus is saying, you're not listening because the Father's not drawn you to me. Is he trying to push the crowd away as he says that? Or is he trying to draw them in? He is stating a deep and unfathomable, invisible reality that anyone who comes to spiritual life is actually drawn by God himself in a way that we cannot see. Just as Jesus said to Nicodemus, you must be born again to see the kingdom of God. And that is a work of God. None of us have a choice over our own birth. But Jesus isn't saying this truth to push the crowd away, but to draw them in. Friends, you know you are the nation of God. You think you've been taught by God. You know that you've come from God's own people. Do you know if you are truly taught by God, you'll be drawn to me? Jesus is saying, if you are truly open to spiritual things, truly listening to God Almighty in heaven, you will come to me to find life in me. If you truly knew the Old Testament, you would be drawn to me the true one who came from heaven. And as he challenges them in that way, he's saying, this is the issue. Yes, God fed your people for 40 years, but you've come to depend upon your privileged history rather than on the God who was feeding you. That manna was a sign to learn that we need wisdom from above, which is better than our own human wisdom. We need the God who sends from heaven daily provision and his words of life. And after a long line of the Old Testament prophets, he has stood before the people, Jesus, the bread of life, the one to whom they pointed, the one who is daily bread. So what's going on if we find ourselves grumbling about Jesus' heavenly authority? Or if we meet someone who flat out denies that Jesus can be more than a man? It seems it's this. There isn't genuine spiritual openness. There isn't really a desire to learn wisdom and receive greater wisdom than our own from heaven. There isn't the humility to see, just as the people at the time of Copernicus needed to see, actually we need to orbit around the Lord and the bread whom he has sent. God has sent Jesus from heaven to teach us, which is why he says in verse 45, everyone who listens to the Father and learns from him comes to me. The crowd then were surprised that Jesus was saying he was from heaven. Surely we ought to be surprised at what God says. Do you think you're wise enough to know all of God's wisdom on your own strength? 
Do you think you're learned enough to, all, to understand all that God understands? No, of course God needs to surprise us. The surprise would be if he didn't surprise us in his teaching. Jesus came from heaven. We need to wrap our heads around that and receive heavenly wisdom. Perhaps this morning we need to say, I am willing to be taught by you, Lord, and I am sorry that I have not been willing. Perhaps we need to open our Bibles this week saying to the Lord, I recognize I've become hard-hearted. My ears have been closed. Please open my mind to your word and wisdom. Such people are truly ready to be taught by God. But there is a second objection here, and it's in verse 51 and 52. Jesus says, I am the living bread that came down from heaven. If anyone eats of this bread, he'll live forever. This bread is my flesh, which I'll give for the life of the world. And the Jews began to argue sharply, how can this man give us his flesh to eat? Well, again, if someone walked through the door and said, you know, take a chunk of my arm, it'll do you the world of good. How would we respond? Of course we'd be skeptical, offended perhaps. Of course we would. But we need to be surprised by God and I need to be surprised by what Jesus is saying here. You see, the objection that these people have is not so much at the gory imagery. They, they know that, well, we know, we can see he, he's speaking of a metaphorical picture. It's not simply the confusion as to what he's saying. I think the objection is he is actually asking us to feed on him, to get close to him. To be graphically involved with him. I say this respectfully, but there is something comfortable about other world religions. Buddhists will invite you to sit quietly and to meditate, to find peace in your mind, as if you can seek for the divine. But there isn't the surprising word that you need to hear and accept. Islamic faith is about doing what God wants of you in order to please him, but it can be very easy to focus just on your own sphere and what your hands and legs and feet do. Jesus is saying, be surprised. I'm getting up, close, personal. Verse 53, unless you eat the flesh of the Son of Man and drink his blood, you have no life in you. And let's be clear, he's not talking about Holy Communion. He's not saying as we eat the bread and wine there, that is the only place to receive eternal life. No, he's saying I am the bread of life. He is the bread of life. He is a person who needs to be received. Just before this conversation in verse 40, he says, um, my father's will is everyone who looks to the son and believes in him shall have eternal life, and I'll raise him up at the last day. So he's using the picture of eating his flesh and drinking his blood to, to, to explain believing in him. But he is saying something we find very offensive. Jesus needs to be very close to us. Not some distant divine spirit we try and trap into, not just looking at the works of our hands and feet. Unless we feed on him, as we need to feed on meals three times a day or more, unless he's as close to us as food gets to us, as it goes into us and nourishes from the inside, unless we depend upon him for everlasting life, as we need to depend on water and bread for these physical tents, these bodies of ours, to stay working. Unless we get that close and feed on him, there is no everlasting life in us. As the people object to what Jesus is saying, really, we've got to feed on you? The answer is yes. Yes. 
get over your offense. I'm the bread of life, and true life is found nowhere else. And if we are genuinely offended, just thinking about this, I suppose to, to one extent, I mean, lots of us will go home to a Sunday roast today, and we're not offended, are we? I mean, we let, we let someone else do it, uh, sort of kill the bird or the animal and drain it of its blood before we sit down and feast. But it's that image that Jesus is using, admittedly of a person, admittedly of himself. But if we're used to eating meat, then perhaps we shouldn't be so offended by what he's saying. He's calling for our gaze to be upon him, to be upon the meal he sets before us. Do you remember how Joe put it last week? It's no work to sit down to a lovely meal someone has prepared for you. And what Jesus is saying is, every day, each meal, each moment, I lay before you something to linger over, treasure, taste, and see that the Lord is good. And you see, it's where a graphic and gory image becomes great and glorious. In speaking of his flesh and blood, Jesus is driving us forward in John's gospel to, a, to, a, to something perhaps the people in John chapter 6 had not yet seen, but to something we can now see. By comparing himself to a Sunday roast, to an animal which has to be killed in order to feed others, he is comparing himself, he's speaking of what is to come, speaking of the cross that is to come, inviting us to see that it will be his flesh and blood which satisfy because he wants us to travel with him through the gospel to Golgotha, to the cross, to see his flesh nailed to the cross, given there for you and me that we might eat, his blood pouring forth there that we might drink, that our sins might be forgiven and washed away, that our death overcome as he says it is finished. To linger over that picture and to say, I need him, that savior, what he did there each moment, every day, three times a day and more. We see a sacrifice there made in our place in flesh and blood which truly feeds for eternal life. When Jesus says his flesh is real food and his blood his real drink, he's saying that as we feed on what he achieved for us there, there is always nourishment. Here is food that as we feast on him will last will never leave us empty in the end as long as we keep feeding him on him and don't try to fill up on trash food. Friends, what does it look like to be a follower of Jesus this week? It means to recognize what's laid out before us. Joe mentioned last week, it's not about apprehending Jesus and understanding lots of intellectual ideas to be a Christian. It's not about mystically tapping in to some sort of mystical religion. It is about receiving a person who is for us, who is given his own flesh and blood for us, that we might find in him the richest of fare. It means cultivating the desire and the time to, to recognize how we need that meal to recognize how our sin really is bad enough to send us to eternal hell. And yet his body and blood really are wonderful enough to save us from those things. It is about recognizing that we can eat trashy food, try and fill up on chasing this world. But in Christ, if we let him, we have someone who fills us with all satisfaction. Of course this is an offensive message. We'd much rather something that we can keep at arm's length, 
But if we're to receive Jesus, we need to let him get onto our insides and work from there. And of course, this, this may feel like a message which isn't life. To those of us who've been trying to walk with Jesus for months or even years, perhaps we're hungry. Perhaps we're tired, weary, thirsty. To my great shame, I'm well acquainted with that feeling. You think the preacher or the pastor's got it all sorted out. But sometimes days or weeks can go by when I feel very hungry. And I think, well, maybe that is because I've tried to breathe in the fumes of Christianity, but I've not sat down to feed on Jesus today or maybe even this week. Friends, if you are hungry, there is only one meal that will fill you and draw you to eternal life. And we, not to, we need not to be ashamed of him. He calls us close that we might feed on him and receive eternal life. I'm going to leave a moment's quiet for us to pause for ourselves to hear again some of the promises that Jesus speaks in this passage and then to lead us in prayer.